<clears throat> Continuing here with chapter four of how to read the Bible for all it's worth. We're on slide number 15. If you're following along on the PowerPoint, I'm talking about the basic rule. The basic rule is this, a text cannot mean what it never could have meant to its authors or readers. Okay, that's why exegesis comes first. First, This rule, of course, does not always help uh, one find out what a given passage means, but it does help sets li setting limits on what it cannot mean, okay? For example, the most frequent justification for disregarding the imperatives about seeking spiritual gifts in 1 Corinthians 14 is a particular interpretation of a preceding moment, which states, when the perfect comes, the partial will be done away. We're told that when the perfect comes in the form of the New Testament, and therefore the imperfect, prophecy and tongues, have ceased to function in the church. But this is the one thing the text cannot mean because good exegesis quite disallows it. There is no way that Paul could have meant this. After all, the Corinthians did not know that there was going to be a New Testament, and the Holy Spirit would not likely have inspired Paul to write something to them that would be totally incomprehensible. Okay, so again, <clears throat> Gordon Fee is a Pentecostal. Gordon Fee is a Holy Ghost guy, okay? But Gordon Fee is also a, a Bible scholar, okay? And, and he's pointing out that Again, many evangelical non-Pentecostals will read that, this section of Scripture, and say, see, the perfect has already come. We've got the New Testament. Okay, but again, they get through. There was no, you know, there's no indication throughout the New Testament from Jesus or Paul or Peter or John or Jude or, in other words, that, hey, we're writing the New Testament. Pay attention. Okay, there, there's none of that happened, okay? So it's just funny that, that people, people do that. Again, you got to think that through, okay? What's the second rule? Go to the next slide. Whenever we share com comparable particulars, such as specific life situations with the first century hearers, God's word to us is the same as God's word to them, okay? So again, if there's comparable particulars, first century 21st century, they're the same. Then that word that was spoken in the first century applies specifically to us. It is this rule that causes most of the theological texts and the community-directed ethical imperatives in the epistles to give modern-day Christians a sense of immediacy with the first century. Again, we, we immediately can relate. It's still true that all have sinned, Romans 3.23, and by the grace of God, we've been saved through faith, Ephesians 2.8, okay? Clothe in ourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience uh, in Colossians 3.12 is still God's word to those who are believers. Our problems here are not with understanding as such, but with understanding it quite well and then failing to wear the clothing, okay? In other words, living it out and being obedient to it is the hard part, not understanding it. Um, again, we've said this before, but most Christians know far more of the Bible than they actually obey, okay? Um, they give the example of two longer passages we work with in the preceding chapter, uh, 1 Corinthians 1 through 4 and Philippians 1, 27 to 2, 18 are the same kind, okay? Once we've done our exegesis and discovered God's word to them, we then have immediately <clears throat> brought ourselves under the same word, Okay? So then if you go to slide number 17, they say, listen, we still have local churches. We still have leaders who need to hear the word and take care of how they build the church. It appears that the church has too often been built with wood, hay, and straw rather than gold, hay, and costly stones. And as such, work when we tried by fire, their work when tried by fire has been wanting. We would argue that Paul's warnings to the Corinthians about destroying God's temple, which is the church, is still God's word to us as our responsibilities to the local church. It must be a place where the spirit is known to dwell and which therefore stands as God's alternative to the sin and the alienation of the worldly society. Okay, the great caution here, we do our exegesis well so that we have confidence that our situations in particulars are genuinely comparable to others. This is why carefully reconstructing their problem uh, is very, very important, okay? Go on to talk about this a little bit further in slide number 18. 
Um, it's significant for our hermeneutics to note that the lawsuit in 1 Corinthians 6 uh, was between two Corinthian brothers before a pagan judge out in the open marketplace of Corinth. We would argue that the point of the text does not change if the judge happens to be a Christian or if the trial takes place in a courthouse. The wrong is for two brothers to go to law outside the church instead of handling things internally, as Paul's own rhetoric makes clear in verses 6 through 11. One could rightly ask whether this would still apply to a Christian suing a corporation in modern-day America. For in this case, not all the particulars are the same. Although one's decision should take Paul's appeal to the non-retaliation -eth non ethic of Jesus into account, okay? So in other words, when you're dealing with a Christian who was wronged by a corporation, let's say there is some defective car part that was never dealt with and it led to an accident that, that hospitalized you or paralyzed one of your family members, okay? That is, that is different enough um, to give you the rationale that yes, you could sue, okay? But again, applying the fact that there should be a non-retaliation ethic um, tempers you trying to sue the pants off of somebody to make millions and millions of dollars as opposed to getting compensation for your damages and nothing more, okay? That, that's applying the, the love ethic of Jesus to what you're doing. The question as to how a text such as a case-specific matter like the lawsuit among believers may apply beyond its specific particulars is but one of the several kinds of questions that we need to address, okay? So then if you go to, um, what is that, slide number 19, they talk about the question of extended application, okay? When there are comparable particulars and comparable contexts in today's church, is it legitimate to extend the application of the text to other contexts or to make a first century case specific matter apply to a context uh, totally foreign to its first century setting? So they give an example um, that it might be argued that even though Paul's warning about destroying God's temple in Corinth in 1 Corinthians 3, 16 and 17 addresses the local church, it also presents the principle that what God has set aside for himself by the Holy Spirit's indwelling is sacred, and whoever destroys it comes under God's awful judgment, okay? Um, in other words, is, could that apply to perhaps suicide, okay? May not this principle now be applied to individual Christians to teach that God will judge the person who abuses his or her body, okay? Suicide, alcoholism, drugs, pick your addiction, right? Could that apply, okay? Similarly, in 1 Corinthians 3, 10 through 15, Paul is addressing those who, with building responsibilities in the church, and the warns of the loss that they who build poorly will suffer. Since the text speaks of judgment and salvation as by fire, is it legitimate to use this to illustrate the security of the believer, okay? If these, again, going on the next slide, if these were deemed legitimate applications, then we would seem to have uh, good reason to be concerned. For inherent in such application is the bypassing of exegesis altogether. In other words, if you use 1 Corinthians 3 to apply to immediate believers, eternal security, um, abuse in your body, if you, if you do that, you, you have not used exegesis. You have not looked at Paul's continuing argument in chapter 1, 2, and then into 3 that he's talking about what is breaking up the body of the Corinthian believers. That's the context. That's the argument. That's the logic train. Okay? You cannot ignore that and then jump and say, well, I just want that to mean the individual believer. That's not what he's saying. Okay? That's not what he's saying. If you want to talk about the individual believer and what they do in their body, look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6, okay, talking about joining members of Christ with a prostitute, okay? Now, he's talking about individual believers there, but he's not doing that in 1 Corinthians 3. To make a claim that he is, is violating exegesis, okay? You're not interpreting the Bible correctly, okay? Um, so, you've just got to realize that. Again, He's saying that, listen, there's a temptation to read the Bible at face value, 
but you can't do that if you miss huge, huge themes like what Paul is trying to say in 1 Corinthians 1 through 3, and you start applying it to individual believers and you ignore. Again, this is also something that I think we do in a Western culture that tends to elevate the individual at the expense of the collective, or we, we emphasize the individual at, a, at the expense of the corporate situation. It's all about me, my personal relationship with God, okay? My rights, hey, it's my life, it's my body, I can do whatever I want, okay? We read those, again, those are ideas of Western culture that are not in the Bible, but we'll read that into, again, 1 Corinthians 3, perhaps, where we see God's temple and we think of it as, as me. Hey, it's, it's all about me anyway, so it must be talking about me. And, and, and that is not what he's talking about. He's not talking about you. He's not talking about your body in 1 Corinthians 3. He's not talking about individual Christians in 1 Corinthians 3. He's talking about the corporate body of Christ. That's why to read the scripture at face value and then preach on it is incorrectly, you're not rightly dividing the word of truth, okay? So then if you go to slide number 21, again, he's, he's continuing this idea of extended application. We argue that when there are comparable situations and comparable particulars, that is particulars in the text that are similar to ours, God's word to us in such texts should be limited to its original intent. Furthermore, it should be noted that the extended application is usually seen to be legitimate because it is true, that is, it is clearly spelled out in other passages where that is the intent of the passage, okay? Um, if that is the case, then one should ask whether what one learns only by extended applications can truly be the word of God for all times and settings. In other words, what he's trying to get at is, okay, if, if, if it, the scriptures, if the epistles are saying one thing in one section of scripture, okay, and you're like, okay, does this apply to today? See if it applies, see if it, that same teaching is argued in another epistle. Okay, if you're finding it is consistently argued or consistently maintained in other books of the New Testament, epistles or otherwise, then it's logical to conclude that yes, it applies to today. It, 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 you have greater, um, there's greater weight on it than it applies to today because there's consistently, it's consistently argued or maintained in other sections of scripture. Okay, hopefully, hopefully that makes sense. Okay, I'm going to stop right there and we'll continue with slide number 22.